My name is Stefan Haas. I'm, I'm the, the founder of that hashtag PeerDojo thing. Um, uh, again, a question. Anyone of you know, know what a dojo, what, what that means? Want to share? <laughs> Dojo is a Japanese word where people used to go and train martial arts. Exactly. Exactly. And, and our idea um, of, the, of the product dojo was uh, so that's Catherine, Catherine Lewis and I came together and, uh, in 2012 and met on the conference. And our idea was there's so much uh, knowledge about tools, processes, and, uh, and how to make uh, products that, that uh, actually people love. But there's a little place where you can try out without getting your head chopped off. Yeah? So the, the idea is that uh, we create a place where you can really get practical on uh, making products that uh, people love, but um, not so theoretical. So today I'm doing something that we normally try to avoid as much as we can, but we, we talk about it. So I have a little talk brought with me. But I also would like to do some, some practical work with you, yeah? so it's a, it's a mixture. So we started with, uh, with this idea, and another idea uh, behind the PO Dojo was that um, uh, when you look, for example, to programmers and developers, they share a sort of occupational culture because they study together in the university, they, uh, they, they actually, they, this is sort of a, a existing network. When you look at the people who are working in product, product management, product owners, you see they are coming from totally different fields. And so they don't have a shared occupational culture. So I, our idea of um, yeah, how can we learn better together is um, actually that there needs to be a network or somehow a shared culture. And that's where you can see also that Conferences like productize really contribute to, and um, so when you look at this culture idea, so how can we? What is what is culture? So how can we define what is what is a good way of working together? Um, so this was really a driving driving idea behind uh, what we wanted to achieve with the, with this few dojo, and we started in Berlin 2012, and uh, between Zurich and. Vienna and regularly have open uh, work workshops and trainings in Berlin where we teach people how to do how to how to do how to create products that customers love. So um, um, what else do we do besides that? We work with companies. There is one company is called Pepper. This is, a, this is a leading platform for people uh, sharing about deals or another company like Salando or Uga. <laughs> And my sugar, uh, all in an innovation field. But here we don't work so much on the product side. We help them actually design uh, collaboration patterns within their organization to become better in making products. So, and this is uh, very much the, the topic I want to talk about today. Is that we believe that to make a product that people love, you need to have a great culture within your organization which defines the boundaries of the way you can behave or your, your behaviors within the organizations. And uh, we use the product thinking itself to do that. And I will show also how the company of MySugar, which is a small, which was a small uh, startup, started in 2012 in a, in, with a medical application, um, is now growing and using this, uh, this, this uh, product thinking and also the idea of uh, organization culture in their, in their way of growing. Um, some other companies we work for, this is uh, very much German automotive uh, companies, also ask us with this product way of thinking to either, for example, reposition their HR services within the organization or um, to design the workplaces for IoT developers, which is something totally new to an organization like a traditional German automotive company, which is more in hardware and production. So again, you see uh, patterns from product thinking applied within the, the way organizations work and to define their culture. So today will be a little bit about this touchy-feely thing uh, about uh, organizations
Foundation Culture, and uh, I will show you uh, two theories that uh, can be very useful to understand it. Uh, one tool that you already have on your table to make it actionable and a showcase from MySugar, how they apply it, and then we will do a little exercise with that. Yeah? So the first, well, before we develop something, um, we should ask why do we do that. So when we develop an organizational culture, the question is why do that. And uh, I would like to you, you to simply just turn to one person here to you, uh, even as one or as as two or three, and have a short conversation, <coughs> like two minutes in uh, in one direction and then two minutes in the other. When uh, when did you have experience? Uh, Company, your company culture, where you work, to be really toxic, to be really a, yeah, not a good place to work. Yeah, please get started. Grab someone close, maybe someone you don't know yet, and share just two minutes about your life, work life, and it was really horrible. Yeah, share that. The most horrible life story, work life story. Just two minutes in one direction and then two minutes in the other. Okay. Okay, so um, from, from hearing just the sound level in this room, obviously there's a lot to share when I ask you to share toxic toxic work experiences. Yeah. <laughs> so it gives me gives me enough reason that uh, makes sense to continue with the talk and that not to do something else. So um, when we jump now into the question, we want to develop something. Maybe developing even is not the right word for it. So what is it when we talk about uh, organization or company culture? Yeah, what, what are we talking about there? And a um, friend of mine, I uh, worked with him, that's Tim Lawson. He was, uh, not he was, he's an uh, he's, uh, uh, architect, software architect and team coach. In that time he was an uh, HR coach at, at uh, the company of uh, Fuga, he said, developing a team is like growing a zucchini. Yeah? And, uh, and his idea was, um, yeah, sometimes people come, hey, we will have to do a team building. And when you think about that, and you take that metaphor, um, how would you build a zucchini? Yeah? So that was something people said, hmm, um, it's a bit strange. Yeah? So, uh, Building teams is like building houses, okay, but uh, can you build teams like houses? And he said, actually, no, you can grow them. And uh, growing them means like, well, you can grow a zucchini. What can you do? You can put the zucchini in, in the sunlight. So I have no, no clue how to grow zucchini. Probably they need a lot of sunlight, I would assume, and give them some water and good soil. Finally, you cut it. Maybe, maybe you take another approach. You're a scientist, so you, you manipulate the, the gene data within the zucchini, so it's growing bigger or in another direction. But in any case, the zucchini will have its own way of uh, living. So you cannot build it like a house. So uh, developing is probably the wrong word that we are using here, and um, it seems to be pretty difficult to to grow uh, or to, to develop something like a, like a team when you believe this, this metaphor. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very often used metaphor when we talk about culture because we have to, to grow it in a way like we have to grow it down. Now the question is, um, is, this, is this enough? Is this addressing the complexity that is uh, within the culture in an adequate level? And I, I would say actually not. So when you, when you take this uh, garden metaphor, um, what is totally different in the company culture is that the gardener, so that you, like a, the CEO or the, the, the head of, or um, the team member, or the HR coach, or whatever role you have, and, and you want to do something about the company culture, you are a part of it. So the gardener or uh, the scientist is actually not part of the zucchini when he wants to, or she wants to grow the zucchini. But in, when you want to work on, the, on your company culture, you're part of that. That makes it very tricky because this is a reflective system. So you're part of that system that you are trying to change. 
Another aspect of uh, company culture, of course, when you compare it with, a, with something like a garden or a zucchini or thing like that, a living system, is that it is it's, it's composed of multiple living systems like humans, plus uh, in like technical companies, of course, um, a, a huge area of technology. So it's a much more complex and much more multi-dimensional thing when we talk about company culture. So it's actually something that we think, oh my god, this is really a yeah, um, shocking complex and really fuzzy in a way and hard to describe and hard to, yeah, actually hard to understand what can we do about that because we really want to change it. When, when, we, when I hear the stories that you have, we want to do something about that. Now, um, when we, oh yeah, water with the person. Uh -huh. Yeah, and um, my, so uh, sorry for the interruption. And um, I just wanted to, because we're filming this, yes. and we want to have your voice recorded. Okay, so okay. thanks. Uh -huh. thanks. So um, um, when you when you look at uh, at that from a product or product manager, product owner, or even designer, a product designer perspective. Then you think, hey, uh, we deal with this type of complexity quite uh, quite often, yeah. So just to summarize, system dynamics that shape the culture is uh, extremely nonlinear and has multiple dimensions. And um, yeah, it's actually a typical wicked problem. And wicked problems are the type of problems that product people are more or less used to, to solve. So when we think about a wicked problem that's uh, on, our, uh, on our desk on a daily basis, it's that uh, we are dealing with products and markets. And products and markets is technology, products, and people who uh, deal with that. So products and markets are at least as complex as uh, the company's culture that creates the product uh, for a market is part of the market. So uh, this, this was actually the idea that um, we use in the cases that I have uh, uh, shown you in the beginning where we created uh, knowledge transfer programs within large organizations uh, or uh, change programs where we use this uh, product thinking that we have learned by uh, creating products or also changing markets for internal purposes. And this is exactly the thing uh, I want to talk about and I will give you some uh, ideas about today. So the question is how do we deal with products and markets? And I have seen that some of you come from the product field. This will be more like a little bit of repetition. I don't want to go too much into detail of that because this is uh, something maybe in another talk, how, how to innovate with with lean methods or uh, design with design thinking, but uh, just that we all are on a similar page with that. Um, product development or a startup or something like that starts with observation. So we uh, want to understand in which domain or which area we are going to innovate. And then we come up with an idea, what can we do about that? Um, followed by some building some work on actually trying to, um, to to get something concrete in our hand, may it be only just an interview with the user or just we do something and from this doing um, we create some uh, insights so we, we do some we do some measurements <coughs> from these uh, measurements we get some data and we do this in an iterative approach so um, this is actually how we how we do how we create products. Yeah. So this is a very general pattern. Uh, this is called a lean startup. But if you're not using that in design thinking, you have a very similar approach where you do go, go from uh, getting into the shoes from of a customer with iterations, testing, and so on. Now the question is that um, in uh, company culture. We have, when we do this observation work and we want to create a model of that, we have to deal with some uh, different aspects of the system dynamics than we have to deal with 
when we talk about markets. So market is quite, uh, there's a lot of research how markets behave. For company cultures, there are different theories. And now I will give you two, um, I would say, Wikipedia level uh, introductions to two theories. And uh, uh, one tool that you have on your table that nicely integrates these uh, theories in an actionable format. And then uh, we will show how, how a company like MySugar is making use of that. And we can then have some time to do the likes of that. So one theory or one model that comes from, from Edgar Schein, he's, in, he's been a, or he is a former professor of MIT Sloan uh, School for, for Management. And he came up with this uh, model of uh, the levels of um, of a culture within, a, within an organization. Um, uh, you, can, you can go uh, to his, uh, either his website or read the fantastic book he, he wrote about that, which is uh, of, um, Leadership and Organizational Culture. And uh, it has just, it's very simple, it has just three layers. Um, so it has a layer of artifacts. Artifacts is anything you can observe within an organization. You can go to the, like you go in, an, in the calendar entries and you check what are, the, what, are, what are the typical agenda items for meetings. And if a company says, hey, we have a high uh, focus on customer, we are customer centric, you would, would expect a lot of meetings that have, or meeting agenda items that have customer work. Yeah, these are the artifacts. Um, and uh, beneath this, these uh, artifacts, um, are the exposed values. These are just the shared but common values within the social system of an organization. This is what people care about when they work with an organization. And underneath these uh, values are underlying assumptions. These are created by a company being successful and the things that make the company successful finally become the, the shared assumptions. Now this is a bit abstract and I would like to, um, to illustrate that with a silly experiment, yeah? So please, ex excuse me, I, I would like to do now a really silly experiment. Um, can you please just take off your shoes? Um, you, you don't have to, but when you, when you like, when you want to follow me with the, with the experiment, I'm wearing uh, jazz food, so I can take it off. So now, now, I'm, now I'm giving you a talk about shoes on on the media, but this whole so. Okay, now we can we can see how this how this uh, connects to the to the uh, model of uh, Edgar Stein. So um, the artifact you see taking shoes off. Some people did, some people didn't. Um, the underlying values: <laughs> cleanliness, aesthetics, status, intimacy. So obviously, when I'm not wearing my shoes, I'm giving a talk. Status, hmm, maybe be affected by that. And they, they see how values actually affect artifacts and vice versa, artifacts affect the values. Yeah, so cleanliness, in my case, well, I, of course I knew what I wanted to do, so I checked my socks before I do that. <laughs> um, so, underlying assumption, yeah, public, people wear shoes at public events. So this is something that we take for granted, yeah. And uh, this, this reflects to, to the values, yeah, obvious. So you can leave it like that, or you can put your shoes on if you like. It's not feeling so bad. <laughs> so last week I've been in a, in a Buddhist center close to my home in, in Berlin. The first time I did that, just because I was very curious about meditation. And when you go there, um, at the entrance, yeah, everyone takes his shoes off. There's no question about that. Um, I mean, when you look at that now with the, with the Edgar Schein culture model, it's the same thing, yeah, same thing, taking shoes off. So you see the same artifact happening. And cleanliness, aesthetic, status, intimacy, probably the same values that are sort of affected. The underlying assumption when you go to these uh, more ritual places where people take the shoes off, often coming from Asia, shoes are unclean, 
don't wear shoes inside. You have a completely different assumption that makes these organizations more successful if you want. So you get a completely different interpretation of the artifact. So this is where um, I think the, the model from Edgar Schein is extremely powerful because what, when you transfer it to organization, you see these innovation rooms that are just set up completely inauthentic, like me asking you to take the shoe off in this meetup, does not fit, and you see the dust on all these desks. Yeah? Just, it's, it's just not working. Yeah? You cannot just introduce an artifact if you don't have the fit with the values and the underlying assumptions. So, um, this was the one, this was the one uh, model. I was, I was really wondering how, how that, for me it feels good with stuff, so I continue. So it seems to be a fit with my personal uh, uh, condition. So the second, the second um, I think extremely powerful model or um, yeah, thinking tool that you can use when you talk about organizational culture is, um, is uh, from Kurt Levine, the equation for uh, behavior that's actually not coming from the field of organizational studies, more um, behavioral, uh, behavioral uh, psychology. And uh, this mathematic formula that you see here means that uh, the behavior, that's the B, is a function of your personal, uh, your, your personal structure or your personality, that's the P, and the environment. So both contribute to uh, the behavior. Um, it's not that you often hear, hey, with these people we will never be successful. I have often my doubt, because often it's more the E in this equation, so the environment, that um, creates some behavior um, and uh, the personalities are not that <coughs> important. And what you see here, um, you see a feedback loop. Yeah? So this function creates the behavior, but the behavior also creates the environment. And when you connect that, I mean, this was more like um, single person psychology, but think about that in a social environment, and we are in a social environment right now. This behavior uh, has a lot of feedback loops that go beyond just the individual person, I think. But there you see also the extreme complexity of uh, yeah, social culture. The interesting thing, what fascinates me, if you take these two theories, um, you see the complexity, but when you see teams behaving or companies behaving, they are not totally random and not totally chaotic. They create culture, so this is something that you can uh, somehow repetitive obs observe, behaviors that are happening, others are not. And uh, so it, it creates itself, it creates some, some structure, it's self-organizing. And now to the tool that we want to use later for uh, playing a little bit around with the culture. That's uh, the culture map, and this is uh, um, how, how the two theories uh, uh, would integrate with, uh, with the culture map. Um, it's a visual tool. Um, so you have enablers, blockers, behaviors, and outcomes. It's just three layers, and don't mix them with the three layers from Edgar Schein. It's a bit different. In the enablers and blockers, you would see the environment and people thing from the Kurt Levine's model. Yeah? So for example, it depends on the people that you, that you uh, hire, uh, and it depends on the environment you create, what kind of behaviors you will find in the, in the organization. So that's the Kurt Levine model in, uh, introduced in this, uh, in this culture map. And of course the behaviors, they create some output, these are the artifacts. And artifacts are, for example, uh, fantastic product designs. Um, with the people, you will find the exposed values and the underlying assumption is something that is shared among the group. <coughs> so this is how, how um, semantically I would connect the two, the two theories with this um, rather hands-on visual tool that was uh, actually uh, originally designed by Dave Gray. And, uh, and then uh, put into, into uh, uh, this format by, by Alex Postman. Yeah, so these are the two authors of that. Now I will go into uh, more practical detail how to deal with uh, company culture with a product mindset. And there we will, then we will see how we can use uh, the tool to help us with doing that. 
So the company of my sugar that I mentioned uh, in, the, in the beginning uh, is, a, is a company uh, we have been or I have been worked with work, been working with since uh, 2012, nearly when they were they were starting. The founder of uh, of my sugar himself, he is a diabetic. I used he's actually a friend of mine. Uh, we used to work uh, together for another company. And his mission or the vision of my sugar is actually to make uh, diabetes uh, suck less. So uh, he's a diabetic and he wanted to, to solve his own problem in life. So um, what he created in 2012 starting was an application um, with an with a extremely high user experience level for diabetics who uh, always have to do this note taking and collect all the data to bring uh, to bring to the to the doctor with them, which they usually uh, uh, did uh, do using a little notebook. Yeah, so that was a, a, a bit of a pain doing that. And um, what else do they do? So they have um, they have uh, now uh, insulin uh, um, uh, dosage calculation within the app and documentation of diabetes data. So that's um, when you look at the product. When you look at uh, how would they deal with their users and customers, then uh, you find this one. And this is sort of an extreme, really <coughs> extreme example. When you look at that, when you look at that arm, and this is not a fact, this is a real uh, photo. When you see the Mashiba logo, which is a little monster tattooed into the arm of a, of a user. Which means that, uh, I mean, this is really a bit shocking, I would say. Um, but when you, what you see here is that there's a really, on the same eye level, uh, a connection between users and people working within MySugar um, to help people who have diabetes. So, um, um, what you see there is that uh, not only Frank was a diabetic, he uh, made a very clever uh, and very smart decision for hiring people who have diabetes too. So they kind of been they have more a community with their with their customers than um, than we provide a product like a pharmaceutical industry company to someone who's not having the same pain that we have. And this is actually was actually the the um, result or the outcome of this internal culture that people have uh, have this strong binding or strong um, connection with uh, with the purpose of the company. Now uh, let's look at let's look a little bit uh, deeper into what they did. Um, they had this really retro thing within their application, and I remember I think maybe I think 2013. We had a product strategy meeting to remove this little diabetes monster, which was a not really well designed, gamified uh, thing in the application that uh, diabetics had to tame when they were using the application. Yeah. So this was this was uh, <coughs> this was uh, the source of the brand and the logo, um, but it didn't function perfectly within the application. Um, still, uh, people found that uh, giving this uh, uh, diabetes, um, this diabetes personal problem, a face like this monster, was really powerful. So this is about how my sugar worked with their customers and their brand. Now look at then now let's look at how they did with uh, their organization. One day they found a designer working on a sketch like that. So um, they took this idea of this diabetes monster that um, was so was was so emotional, emotional relevant for the people outside of the company to be a perfect atavar for people who were working inside the company. So they started creating monsters, and here you see uh, the monster of Christian uh, Christian Hattinger. He was uh, one of the, I think, the fifth employee at uh, at My Sugar, working as an uh, original starting in QA and now working as the agile agile coach at My Sugar. That was his monster, 
and that um, was became was becoming a uh, becoming a sort of company standard that uh, people created uh, were, were creating their own monster had their own uh, monsters uh, design. Um, here you see Frank, for example, Frank Westermann, that's the founder. Um, other people, oh, here you see, by the way, me. Um, I'm not so happy with the design of my monster. Um, yeah, but they just gave me also a monster within the world of the diabetes monster. So, what does this create? This creates a strong, a strong relationship between um, the employee and the company because this is sort of me being part of this monster tamers. Um, they continued working on that. Um, um, these monsters became the Atavas uh, when they were doing agile planning. So you find these monsters as a functional tool in uh, their agile process. Um, so this was one thing, where you see that uh, the design approach that they used for um, working with their customers was used also with their employees. Now, my sugar became more successful, and they uh, got from uh, being part of being working on a, in a small co-working space, having more people, and they got their own uh, office space. So the office space looks like that, and what they did is um, they used the same product thinking that they used with their users and designing these avatars, um, also for <coughs> designing the space where they do their work. Because of exact this thinking that I wanted to um, get across with the models, that um, the structure that you create, the environment, creates um, uh, triggers for personalities which have a lot uh, to do with, with diabetics, so a lot of passion with bi to solve the diabetics problem, that is uh, actually helping the company to be successful. So what you see here is a lot of visual uh, um, visual wall space behind the behind the desks, and you see a typical open co-working space that you would expect from a modern uh, star. What else? So they start to design um, their own tools. I remember I was introducing Scrum as a framework to work uh, together with the teams, and what they what they did is um, they created visual patterns that they can use to uh, implement the process. So you have a sort of environment which is a simple card uh, uh, layout or uh, layout on the wall of the room, um, which is the environment plus the team which creates the environment, which creates the behavior of visual planning and uh, visual communication. Um, besides the space that they use to collaborate openly with the team, they designed um, spaces where people just did their, where could go to get their phone calls done, so private rooms. Um, then they created a very specific type of Besprechung um, means uh, in this German it means a meeting room where they have to, to discuss a topic, which was a stand-up room, small table in the middle and no seats, because they wanted to avoid this typical we sit on the table and we, we are not moving. They created a specific conference room. So what they did is they, they analyzed the types of behavior they needed to, to, be, uh, to, to see during the office time, and they designed spaces around that. And last not least, they designed a kitchen where uh, they expected a lot of social behavior to happen within, within the office. So, um, now this was then, um, uh, in June, I think it was June, or mid, in 2017, uh, My Sugar became part of the Roche uh, family, so they, uh, they actually been, um, did an exit and acquired by a large pharmaceutical in, in the, um, company. And now um, they have the task to grow uh, to, to triple in size in 2018. So um, the thing that we were now thinking about is how can we keep uh, how can we keep this uh, this culture that actually was uh, very 
much um, the root cause of the big success of uh, my sugar. How can we keep that um, and grow that and nurture that like the zucchini I, I, I was talking about in the beginning um, when they want to grow. So we were not talking so much about like having seven, several levels of, of hierarchy within the company. We were talking about what is the essence in the, in the, in the culture and how can we keep that to grow. Um, one example for the office building, what they are currently doing is what product developers are doing. First of all, they patch the current system because now uh, the office building is too small. Uh, they have problems with a uh, lot of phone calls going on, a lot of discussions in the open uh, environment because the meeting rooms are occupied. So they put little boxes in the, in the open space that people can just uh, go into these spaces. So typical product behavior, so the product is not fit anymore, we patch it. And they do a lot of user interviews and research with their employees to design the new product, uh, the new um, company office uh, uh, structure. So they design their own, their own work environment. And, um, they work with their employees and the culture map to find out what is now working well, what is actually getting into their way in growing, and how can we keep the, uh, the, great, uh, the great company culture in a shape that helps us uh, growing. And uh, I personally did one interview, that's Clara, Clara is a customer, that uh, Clara is a, is a product manager, a product owner at MySugar, and I will give you just uh, the result or the outcome from the interview in this template that you have on the table, the culture map, before we do this uh, little exercise. Yeah? Um, so here's the culture map again with the, with the three levels. And um, one main outcome of uh, my sugar definitely is uh, making users or diabetics life, life easier. Another one is uh, improve the security for users and make the product more accessible by connecting with, uh, with payers to, uh, to help users to make, to make the purchase for, for the product. So, um, one behavior that you want to see in this organization is contact with users, show, contact with users and show what we are working on and get feedback on a very high level, high level or high frequency of getting feedback. Or user research and collect feedback. Um, work close together with a support team. So these are, these are typical behaviors you would like to see on a, on, a, on a product level. So what do we need for that? What are the core assumptions that need to be present within the organization? Definitely on the people side, here you see the P in this uh, um, uh, Levin formula, passion about solving the problem. So you hire people who have a high passion to solve the problem. Um, you want to have a lot of peer feedback. So peer feedback is a core element that you want to have in your organizational uh, culture and the visual tools you have seen on the, on the design of the office space. An open, open office architecture. So these things help you to collaborate more. So collaboration in cross-functional teams of PO, UX, development and QA is a core enabler and also is a core, I would say, behavior that you want to see in an organization that uh, creates a product that, that uh, fits to the customer. Work close uh, with team, tester, designer, developer. So as a product developer or product manager, you, you work very close uh, with the team. And you have, for example, a, a goal uh, system within your company, like MySugar is using OKRs for that, that gives you, that gives you some direction. Um, that you use for a lot of storytelling about long-term vision, uh, explain the why we do things, and, uh, and all of that, so the long-term vision helps you to acquire industry partners and insurances, contribute to the bigger vision of the company. And then we come to the blockers that uh, show up while the company is growing. For example, fast growth, interviewing and onboarding people. That was obviously a blocker because this is taking a lot of time. 
uh, from the key people, that means the people who are also doing the job. Or key, key people being single point of failure, which is something that blocks you in scaling the organization. Or too many opportunities. So you scale and you have more opportunities, so you have to make uh, more hard decisions in terms of prioritization. <coughs> Um, then you uh, find that uh, the OKR system is uh, probably too short term in thinking. So you see that uh, maybe just having uh, quarterly goals may not help you to achieve the real high, uh, um, the real long term uh, strategic uh, uh, goals. And maybe the room is too narrow, so you don't have this dedicated team space anymore. So. Um, what you see here is just a tool that you can use to, to um, create a model um, of, your, of the findings when interviewing and talking uh, to, to your customers or so the employees. And this is just the result of a 120 minutes interview I did with Clara. And you iterate that and there you may find then some patterns. Now, um, this is just creating the model that you do when you do a startup, you have a model and then you need an idea what to do. Yeah? So it's not just there to create a model, it's just there to do something. So um, you narrow down on, for example, one. You say, hey, no dedicated team space. Yeah? Seems to be obvious, you can address that with um, the design approach I was uh, talking about. And um, sorry for this. Um, And then you start iterating around uh, this. Um, oh, so the animation was good. So you start iterating around <coughs> exactly this one uh, issue that you find as a blocker within your culture map. The good thing, or that the useful thing uh, I see uh, doing this modeling, is that you uh, create a, a, a hypothesis for where you would like to invest your time in changing something within your organization. Plus you have a visual tool to agree on um, what are the influencing factors and, uh, and what could, could be the, the potential outcome of the change. 